scene that was taking place. And if you'll remember the scene, uh, there were 24 elders, and we just discussed the fact that we didn't know exactly who they were. There's a lot of uh, opinions out there, but we do know this, that 24 elders have 24 crowns, and there were also four beasts. And we do know that in other places in the Word of God that it talks about these four beasts, and, uh, it, and, and it talks about it in the book of Ezekiel, and they're around the throne. And there's a repetitive uh, scene that's taking place in Revelation 4 where they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. These, these four beasts cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then what happens is, is that the 24 elders take their crowns off and they throw them at the feet of Jesus. Amen. And they want to, the, 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 as a matter of fact, let's go, let's go back a little bit. And so it says right here in Revelation 4, the four and 20 elders, we'll go back a little bit further, verse 9, chapter 4, verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor, sometimes if they're called beasts, we came to the conclusion that they're also really, they're angels. Okay, they're, they're re referred to as angels. They're referred to as cherubim. I, thought, I told you that this was a kind of an interesting side note that Lucifer was con is called the cherub, the anointed cherub that covers. So the idea is, is that in some way he was connected to this class of these angels, which are these four beasts or living creatures or angels that are before the throne of the Lord always, and they either rest for day or night. And they give honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever. And when they do this, the four and twenty-four elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and they worship him that lives forever and ever. And they cast their thrones before the throne. And this is what they say. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. I want to just focus on this a little bit right here because it just was ringing true to me. And, and as I was reading and thinking about it, then they say this, this is why, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. I just, real quick, I want to make a point that, that the Lamb, now when we're talking about the one on the throne, we're talking about the Father here. Because when we're about to realize that, because whenever we transition into chapter 5, we're going to see that the Lamb goes and takes the scroll from the, from the one on the throne. But what I want you to see is, is, is that it says that, that all things are created for God's pleasure. They are and were created for, the, for God's pleasure. And he's worthy of glory and honor. So really and truly, God didn't have to create. But he created because, I don't understand it, even the psalmist David said, What is man that you're mindful of him? Whenever you really start to get a little bit, when we all get a little closer to God, and then we look at our own lives, surely we've all wondered, Lord, why would you even want to have a relationship with me? I don't understand okay. it exactly, but i got to tell you, God loves you, amen? And he loves me. Thank you, Jesus. And he, and he loves, the whole reason, and I know we talked about this a lot when we studied way back in the book of Genesis, when, when you look at the creation story, and again, just a real quick concept here, that God created things so that the world could be inhabited. In other words, it was very mindful in the way that he created. He, he created the heavens and the earth. He created the sun before he ever, he had, there was water before he ever said, let the earth bring forth the, the vegetable, right? Because without photosynthesis, I'm not trying to turn this into a science class, I'm just trying to make a point, that without photosynthesis, without sunlight, without water, veg, vegetation doesn't grow. Before he created the animal life, he created vegetation so that the animal, what I'm trying to, before he created man, he created all of those things. Why? It's clear to me. God was creating a place that would be able to inhabit his prior creation. For his pleasure, all things were created. For his pleasure, you were created. And it brings him pleasure for us to worship him. That's right. Now, I got to tell you this, that the Father, the way he created was through the Word. Okay, I'm not trying to get real technical about this, but I want you to understand that in the book of Colossians and also in Hebrews, now we're talking, not talking about God just speaking, God the Father, I mean, the pre-existent word of God is Jesus. You understand that he was eternal. Before he became man in the flesh, he was the eternal word. We could also say he's the eternal son. 
Will we completely understand it on this side? I don't think that we will, but we need to understand that God is three, but yet he's one. Mm -hmm. Now, not just, I, I don't know how else to tell you, but three distinct personalities. There's a Father, there's a Son, there's a Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word became flesh. God created through the Word. The Word of God spoke, and, <clears throat> and the eternal Word spoke, and then the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. And when the eternal Word spoke, the Holy Spirit created, all right? And, but I want you to know that it was for God's pleasure that all these things were and are created. And so, the, and so these four beasts or these four angels or these four living creatures, this is what they do in heaven. It's like a repetitive movie, if you will, that says, Lord God, you are worthy of glory and honor. And every time that they do that, the 24 hours, they take their crowns and they throw them at the feet of Jesus. And, then, and so that was the last scene that we talked about in chapter 4. So that was the big scene in chapter 4. It was setting us up for scene number 5. But guess what? All this is setting us up for when we move into Revelation 6. Because in, in, in chapter 5, the scene surrounds the concept of the seals. Now, I don't really have a piece of paper. I should have been a little bit more prepared. Does anybody have a whole piece of paper? Can I just... Look, I'm going to use one of these right here. Look, this is going to be okay. We're going to act like this is a piece of paper. It's going to work. <laughs> this is going to work, my friend. So look. Let's just pretend I want to try to give you an idea. You ever watched an old movie during the King times? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like King Arthur or something like that? And you ever saw how they would have, like, the king has a ring and he burns the little candle. He, signed, he writes a letter, right? He, he folds it over and then he lights a candle and he drips the wax on there and he takes his ring in and he puts a seal on it. That seals the envelope so that the courier, <coughs> when he brings it to the person, they know that it hasn't been opened, right? Okay. So these seals really, when we get into chapter 5 here in a second, it describes it as a book, but in the Greek language, it really describes it probably a roll or a scroll, okay? And so it's kind of probably more than likely like seal number one is actually at the bottom. And then if you would imagine seal number one's right there, and if you poured some wax on there, and then you rolled it over, you see, and each one of them was like that. So seal number seven was probably at the top. And then we put a little, some wax on there and we seal it. And then seal number six, and then we seal it. And then seal number five, and then we seal it. And then seal number four, and then we seal it. And then seal number such and such till we get to seal number one. And then the scroll is ready and seal number one hasn't been broken. Now one of the things that I want, and I've read, this is just a reiteration, this is relative, you know, like a review, because we've talked about that. We've been teaching on end times for a long time, know, six months, seven months. Many, many times people have taught in the church that in the last seven year period, that's how I'm kind of describing it now, the last seven. We talked about that in Daniel chapter 9. I don't want to get into lost and in all of that again. But, but it's very clear according to Daniel chapter 9, that's the one place in the Bible that talks about a last seven year period. I need, I need you to understand that. We're not going back to it, but I want you to understand. I'm scoured the Bible. I mean, that doesn't mean I'm not fit to miss something, but I'm just saying. There's only one spot in the Bible that talks about a last seven-year period, and it's in Daniel chapter 9, okay? And, 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 and that's what we're in now. The book of Revelation talks multiple times about 3.5 years, 42 months, which is three and a half years, 1260 days, which is three and a half years, time, times, half a time, which is three and a half years. Multiple times, the Bible talks about 3.5 years, but only one time does it talk about seven years, okay? In Daniel 9, what we learned is this is that the last seven-year period begins whenever the Antichrist signs a, an agreement with the nation of Israel. That's what begins the seven-year period. The reason that I'm making a big deal about that, all my life growing up in the church, I was taught the, that the rapture is going to happen and then the seven-year period takes place. Okay? I'm not telling you if, if, that's what, if that's what you want to believe, but what I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's no distinct place in the Bible that describes that. But what it does describe is that when the Antichrist signs that agreement, that begins the last seven-year period because it also says in Daniel 9 that in the middle of that last seven-year period, the Antichrist breaks the covenant. Now, as we move forward and we start opening up these seals, and we start opening it up, I'm going to break it down. 
very clearly. But what I want you to know is, is that chapter 5 is just setting up chapter 6, which is where the seals begin to open. Now, I will mention this just in passing, that, that the first seal, and we won't get there until next week, the first seal is the rider on the white horse. The rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. That is not Jesus. Jesus comes in chapter 19 of Revelation. So he's a fake Christ. Okay, that's what the world's been waiting for. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that seal number one, I believe, is coinciding with the signing of that agreement. All right? And so, again, the question is, is that whenever that first seal is broken and open, and loose. I was just trying to give you a little bit of an idea. Now, again, granted, this is a physical concept of what a scroll would look like. We're speaking spiritually, but this is the idea behind it, okay? And so the scene in heaven is that there's four living creatures, four angels, four cherubim, four beasts, whatever you want to call them. And again, they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You are worthy to receive glory and honor, for you have created all things, and all things have been created for your pleasure, and then again, poof, the 24 hours flow the crown from the ground. All right? And then, and then let's start in Revelation 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of, right hand of him that sat on the throne a book or a scroll, right? We just showed you that. Written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Now, I want you to see, I want you to, let's take notice of the word worthy, okay? Because not just anybody can open up these seals. I, I don't mean to get ahead of myself, but I need you to know this is a big deal, okay? This is a really big deal. Like, heaven is very aware. If you and I could be there, it, it, uh, it's a very serious situation is what I'm trying. All right, and they're looking for somebody that would be worthy to open it. And the word worthy means is the kind of the idea that as we move forward in these next couple verses, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yet the, the worth had to be earned. Now, you and I understand <laughs> that in our walk with the Lord, we're, we can't earn anything with God, right? Like, in other words, we don't walk by, we, we're not saved by works, but we're saved by faith. And we're sanctified by faith. We've talked about that. Okay, but yet at the same time, when the Lord does a work on the inside of our heart, He gives us strength to do to do works for Him. But listen, for Jesus, He accomplished the work. Yes, right. Jesus believed right. by faith, but guess what? He had to do the work. He's the one that worked for us. That's that's really the message of the cross. You need to understand that. Or the message of the new covenant says Jesus has already gone before you and accomplished the work. That's why you can rest in his finished work. And when you do that by faith, God the Father wants to reward you. Because see, now you're believing God the Father according to his plan that he predetermined before the foundation of the earth. See, whenever you and I are lining up, not just for salvation, but also to live for the Lord. And it pleases the Father whenever you and I put our faith in what God has done. The main point I'm trying to make is this. Jesus earned what he earned. How did he do it? By his obedience. You see, the only reason you and I can even be obedient is because he went before us and was obedient. Amen? Does that make sense? I hope it does because it just, that's, that's the word. Amen? <laughs> Verse 3. No man in heaven, nor in the earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So you got to remember now, we went back, let's go back to, Jen, to Revelation 4. The, the Bible says that John, the beloved, heard, as it were, the voice of a trumpet. And the voice said, come up hither. Now, I spent a lot of time on that. Because many people in the church that believe in that preacher, pre-tribulation rapture believe that that's the rapture. And so what they're saying is, John is the church. And then when he gets up there and he sees the 24 elders, they say, and they're dressed in white clothes, they're saying, see, that's the rapture, 24 people. But I made a point last week, and we're going to break it down when we get to it, that between seal number six and seven, there's a heavenly multitude of people that are dressed in white rain. Okay. But the, so, and it also says that he, he said immediately I was brought up in the spirit. And one of the points that I made is the rapture of the church is a bodily resurrection, not, a, not just a spiritual resurrection, right? And so if we say that John 
going up into heaven was a type of the rapture, I'm totally cool with that, right? But it's not the rapture, because he specifically said, I went up in the spirit, not bodily, okay? And so there he is in heaven. And so he's taking all this in. He Come up hither, and I will show you things that are to come. And so he's taking all this in, and he sees the four the four heavenly angels or beasts, whatever you want to call them. He sees the 24 elders. He sees that scene I just told you about. And now we transition to this scene and there's a scroll in the hand of the one that's sitting on the throne and they're looking for somebody to be able to loose these seals, but there's nobody worthy. Okay. And so then he says that I wept. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now, I just want to stop for a second. I want us to kind of think for I always love to think whenever I read the Bible, because sometimes we just read. You know what I'm saying? And we read too fast, and we really got to contemplate these things. I don't know about you, but there's kind of like a part to me that says, like, why are you itching so bad for these seals to be open? Because when these seals are open, it's about to get really, really nasty. You understand what I'm getting at? But what I need you to understand, what I need to try to understand, is that I don't even can't find the words to, to describe it. Heaven is yearning at this point for these seals to be open. And heaven is looking. Is there a man that's worthy to open? And there's nobody worthy. There's nobody worthy in heaven. So listen to me. If you're talking to somebody out there on the outside of these walls and they're trying to judge down on you, listen to me, friend. There's nobody worthy. And there's nobody worthy in heaven. There's no human being worthy in heaven. And there's no human being worthy on earth. And there's no human being that's been buried and gone. And he weeps because heaven is anticipating this moment for this first seal to be able to be broken. The only thing that I know to tell you is, is that it's the word of God. See, that's one of the things that I've been trying to explain over the last year too. The word of God has it written. There's going to be some things that have to take place on the earth. Exactly when they happen, we don't know, but it's written in God's word that there's going to be perilous times. And it says that if the time wasn't short, that even the <coughs> elect would be deceived. It's going to, whatever's going to happen, when, if, if I, I hope we're not here, okay? But whatever's going to happen, it's going to be, you just think. You're going through some stuff now. I just think I'm going through some stuff. No. And, and, and it's written. And part of the reason it's written, you know, let me, let me just say this real quick. Because maybe the question would be, well, hold, well, hold on a second, Pastor. The Word of God says that, that we weren't appointed unto life. Okay. I'm glad you asked. Because, see, I made it clear. I'm going to make it even more clear. The opening of the seals is not the fact of God. That's right. Matter of fact, the opening of the seals can be created by man. See, the Antichrist comes on the scene in famine, and sword, means war, and death. All these things can be created by man. As a matter of fact, you and I, I mean, I haven't really watched the news, but I've been told that there's all kinds of ships out there that aren't even coming into, into harbor. And, they're, and they, ha they have all these goods. Well, who's telling those ships that they can't come into harbor? Some man, somewhere, somehow is saying, don't bring the ships into harbor. And the ships are full of harbor. How easy is it for them to say, no more ships? Do you understand what I'm trying to get at? How easy is it for a man to, to cause a war to start? It happens all the time. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's a big difference between the wrath of God and the wrath of the enemy. There's a big difference between the wrath of God falling on man, and we will make it very clear as we move forward that there is a distinct difference between the wrath of God and the opening of these seals and the work of the Antichrist upon the earth in the beginning of this last seven-year period. And in the middle is when, right around the middle is when the wrath begins. But, I, but one of the things that I've said is this, and it's in 2 Thessalonians, and we'll cover it real close when we get there, 2 Thessalonians 2. And it says, he says that he's going to allow the Antichrist, the man of sin, the man, the man of perdition, to bring, let me paraphrase, lies, okay, with all deceivable works. He's going to allow the Antichrist to perform miracles. It says in Revelation 13, he's going to allow the Antichrist and the false prophet to call, to bring fire down from heaven just like Elijah did in the Old Testament. And you may question, why? Why, God? Why would you do that? Well, it tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2. You want to know why? Because they chose to believe a lie rather than the truth. Because mankind on the earth, many times, and listen to 
sometimes you and I do it a little bit, but thank God we're not doing it big. But sometimes we would choose to believe a lie rather than the truth because sometimes the truth doesn't give us what it is we want. Unfortunately, mankind outside of Christ, that's all he wants. He wants a lie. He wants to be able to say, oh no, I can love whatever I want to love. I can be whatever I want to be. All in contradistinction to the Creator and what He has made and what He has said in His Word. Mankind in His own heart said, this is what I want. And so guess what God's going to do? It says it in Romans chapter 1. It, it, it's a type of wrath. It's really going to be poured out, but right now we are experiencing a type of wrath where God gives people what they want. And whenever he gives what they want, guess what happens? He moves further and further away. we got to be careful, church. All of us, even in our Christian walk, when we demand to get what we want, many times we can actually move the Holy Spirit further away. It doesn't mean that he's going to leave or forsake you. Amen. I don't know about you, but I know that there's been times, even in my Christian walk, where I find myself far from the Lord, but he's just one whisper away. I just want to encourage you with that. Amen. But the world as a whole has rejected the message of truth. Amen. And because of that, God's going to let let them be deceived because that's really what they want. All right. And, and so my main point to all of that was is that all this is written. And so even though it's kind of like, why heaven are you anticipating? Why, John, are you weeping? Because it's written. And it has to be able to come to pass. And so he says, no one was worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders says unto me, Weep not. Behold. I mean, that word behold, I like it. I like King James language. I mean, it's kind of poetic, you know, once you get used to reading. Behold, lo, look. You know, like, look upon this. Stop what you're doing and pay attention. Okay. So, so John's over here weeping. Whatever's going on, it, it, it's a very, very tense situation in heaven. All this is happening, but you can feel that there's nobody worthy. And we under, and he understands some. In the spiritual realm, he understands that in order for God's plan to move forward to the next stage, somebody's got to be able to That's right. He said, and to be honest with you, church, you know, you know, when you're watching my video, a lot of times what happens is, is that, and I think we can all agree to this, that many times we tend to love this world more than we should, right? That's yeah. good. Come on. I mean, we, we, all, we, we all love the luxuries of life. We all... Let's not be first to admit it, man. Just, you know, but that's why the Lord said, don't love the world or the things of the world. I mean, he talks about this, the sequelness of, of riches and how the cares of the world. He says that in the parable of the sower, that, that some of the seed was sown among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and they choked out the life of the seed. And the seed was the word of God. The seed was the truth of God. Amen? And whenever, whenever you get it saved, the seed of God's gospel is what it is it is in your life. It's in your heart. And what will happen is, is that the, the enemy will try to use the things of the world to try to choke it out. Right? And and you know, many times in even in my own walk, you know, I don't know I preach this all the time, but we're always looking for something new. Right? I mean if we're honest. I used to always come up with something, oh I gotta get married first. Don't come back yet, Lord, I gotta get married. I gotta have kids. And, and I was like, Lord, I don't want to be born in the man, not in this crazy world. Plus, I'm like, Lord, I have a hard time taking care of a dog. I want to take care of another child. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just, you probably don't feel that way. Don't get me wrong. I was a crazy little baby. They are a kid like to blow in their belly, but I like to go and go back to their mom. Um, you know, but I'm just saying, we can always find something new. Lord, prolong it just a little bit longer, but hey, that's not what heaven said. That's right. Heaven's saying, can't you find somebody worthy? And the elder says, don't weep. Behold. Don't weep because, lo, look, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, I mean, there's a whole lot of biblical texts that we can go backward, right? The tribe of Judah, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Amen. And, and you know, look, I'm not going to go there, but but in the but in the scripture, it, it, it actually says that uh, in Genesis 49, that Jacob laid hands on each one of his 12 boys, and Judah was the third born. And, and he told Judah, he said that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now this is close to 2,000 years before Jesus was ever born. What does the scepter mean? It's the king's staff. And he says, this king's, I mean, I'm, here, I'm translating for you. The king's staff shall not depart from Judah. 
till Shiloh comes. And the word Shiloh is translated by the rabbis to mean till the one comes to whom it belongs, talking about the Messiah, meaning that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. So that was prophesied 2,000 years before Jesus ever came. And if you do the lineage in Matthew and in Luke, you realize that both Mary and Joseph came from the tribe of Judah. And also, here we go, it's even deeper, the root of David has prevailed. Because not only did they come from Judah, but both Mary and Joseph came from the lineage of David. Solomon, I'm sorry, Joseph came from Solomon's lineage, and Mary came from Nathan's lineage, and both of them were sons. Okay, so they were distant, 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 distant cousins. Don't go marry your cousin. All right. So it says right here, the root of David has prevailed. Now, what was interesting to me, I noticed this in my, uh, whenever I was reading it, and I, and I looked, if you look at it, back at uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and we'll come back to Revelation 5, 5, but in, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says this right here. It says, and there shall come forth a rod, that's another word for a branch, out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, what, what, who is Jesse? Does, does anybody know who Jesse is? I'm sure y'all do. David's. Yes. David's daddy. Oh, David's daddy. That's yes. exactly correct. So, Isaiah prophesied 700 years before Jesus was born that there would be a a rod or a branch that would grow out of Jesse, and that was a messianic prophecy, okay? So that it was coming from that lineage, right? But I want you to know something, that this scripture right here says that he's the root of David. Now, that's so good, because he's not just a branch, he's the root, okay? And that matters, because you see, in his pre-incarnate state that I was talking to you about earlier when I said he was the pre-existent word that spoke the world into existence, he's the root of David. You see what I'm saying? For all things were created by you and for your pleasure they were created. And God the Father used the eternal word, which was the pre-incarnate Jesus, to speak the worlds into existence. And he is the root of David. But guess what? In his incarnate state, meaning in his flesh, as born on that gl glorious night that we just recently celebrated, whenever heaven opened and the angels sang, peace on good earth and goodwill towards men. Now the word became flesh. Hallelujah. And now he's the branch of David. So he's the root of David. He's the branch of David. And look what he did. He prevailed. He prevailed to open the book and to loose the seal. You don't have to cry anymore, John. Because guess what? We found one that's worthy. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the root of David. And look, there he is. He's worthy because he's prevailed to loose the seven seals. He's about to open those seals. And look what it says. And I beheld. So I looked. I listened. And lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain. I just want to stop there for a second, because I want you to see something. I want you to slow down. He said right here, he said, weep not, behold, the lion. You know, you ever thought about that? I mean, Hollywood steals the Bible stuff all the time. Hollywood's constantly still. They ever thought about the lion king? I mean, think about that. The lion king. See, the lion is the king of the jungle. The, the word of God describes Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the king of kings and the lord of lords. But look, what I want you to see is this. He's the one that he's, and, and look, he's prevailed. How did he prevail? See, that's one of the things that I've always, ever since, ever since the Lord has opened up our eyes to this new covenant message, or if you want to call it the message of the cross, whatever you want to call it, and I've been preaching it. There, I've, been, I've been challenged by many a preacher, by preachers, okay, to say, why are you, because it's everywhere, every page you turn, you just gotta know what you're looking for, man, what are you trying to say, look, the lion, the, the victorious one, the king, he has prevailed, well, okay, well, how did he prevail, well, look at the next scene, I'll be held away. A behold of lamb as though it had been slain. See, the power of the lion is because he was willing to be the lamb. Now, what does that mean for you, Christian? Amen. It means a lot. It means a lot because it means that the power that Jesus won when he prevailed at Calvary, hallelujah, 
You now have access to that power. I got, listen, you don't just need to believe it. I need to believe it. We need to believe it every day. That Jesus has, yeah, we're talking about the right here. We're talking about the loosing of the seven seals. But guess what? Until that day, you and I have access to victory. You and I have access to the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen us. And you know what I know? That he wants to give us strength. You know why I know that? Because he wants people to hear this good news. That's right. Before this, first seal is open. He wants people to be able to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they too can become part of the eternal family of God. Amen? It's a, it's, it's a beautiful thing. For you're, you're worthy to receive glory and honor. For, for you have created all things and for your pleasure all things have been created. So listen, he's the victorious lion. He's worthy to loose the seals. He has prevailed. But the reason why is because he was a lion. He willingly, and listen, there's so much biblical truth in this, right? Uh, let me just stop for a second and talk to you about some of the writings of Paul and, and connect it to this. Jesus' willingness to humble himself and die, he was a willing servant. Everything, listen, everything about the Bible is in complete contra contradiction to the world around us. Do, do you get that? We've got to be able to start seeing this. Uh, okay, again. Kings that live in palaces, and I know I say this all the time, but I don't think that we can. Kings live in palaces. The Bible says in the book of Matthew that kings are born in palaces and they wear silken clothes. Jesus was born in a manger, and he was probably wrapped in sackcloth, some kind of burlap sack. Jesus was born in a manger, and he rode into town on a donkey. <laughs> okay. And, 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 and you know, you're, you're expecting, and even the church, you understand what I'm saying? Like, think about it. I'm not encouraging you to watch TV in. I'm not, because it's garbage. I'm saying that don't get it. Don't watch it. It's lies. Okay, but I want you to, next time you're at front of the TV and you got your clicker, go ahead and just check it out for a second. And see the show that's going on. And you tell me, listen, I'm not trying to say if the church is, just because the church has golden chandeliers and golden chairs that the preacher falls off, and that's not what I'm trying to say. But what I'm trying to say is, is that the emphasis in most of the modern church is all about money. It's all about something big. It's all about all this stuff. And so guess what? Somebody walks into a church when there's 20 people and they automatically think that it's not of the Lord. That is such a lie. That is such an American mindset. It's such a, most of the time people don't want to hear the truth anyway. We've already come to that conclusion. And, and so what I'm trying to say though is this, is that. That the, that, the, that the lion has power because of the lamb, because he was willing to submit himself to the will of the Thank Father, Jesus. and he willingly humbled himself. Amen? And now listen, in New Testament truth, this holds for you and I today, spiritually speaking. Paul said this, he said, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. The word of God, John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he must so that he might increase. Amen. You know, the whole of the truth of the gospel is, is that as you and I humble ourselves to God's word, oh by the way, in order to humble yourself to his word, you gotta understand it. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Praise God. I, I asked Daniel to order some things for the church. Okay, to where you can where we can maybe read through the Bible. In this next year, Amen. Because I think it's important that as believers we read this one, Amen, from beginning to end, at least once. It's important because, see, if you read the whole Bible from beginning to end, you'll be able to get a big picture of the whole story of God. And then, within the big picture, you can see the pieces, and it all begins to make sense that God has a plan, Amen. And it all falls within what we're seeing here. But I want. But again, I don't want to get ahead of myself. That was a side note. I just want to make a, a point that the same way Jesus willingly humbled himself to the Father and willingly died, you and I have to willingly surrender our lives to the Father's will. And then, spiritually speaking, we, our old man, begins to die. It's a spiritual cross. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's not a piece of wood. It's something spiritual happening that Jesus has already done it. And now when I line up with the Lord, he allows the spirit to put us to death. It says that. Mortify your member. It says in the book of Romans, a circumcision of the heart that's done without the hands of man. 
<laughs> and he says the cross is like a scalpel. <laughs> it, it begins to put to death the old name. Does that make sense? So within the lion, you see the lion has its power because of the lion. And he, like, he has seven horns. You know, the number seven is the number of fulfillment. It's God's perfect number. We understand that God created six days, and on the seventh, what did he do? He rested. Why do you think he rested? He was tired? No, God is tired. The God of Israel does not slump. He rested to show us that the work was complete. Amen? Yeah. He, gave, he gave Israel the Sabbath, not so that everybody freaks out and has to go to church on Saturday. No. <coughs> he gave us the Sabbath so that we would understand rest. He gave us Jesus to fulfill the rest so that you and I would learn to willingly humble ourselves and submit ourselves. See, we're searching. We're searching in this old world and we're looking for happiness and we're running to and fro, looking for some kind of fulfillment, looking, like even in the modern church, they run, we run. I say they, I don't know, we. We run. We run to another preacher. To another miracle. Oh, look at the glory cloud in Redding, California. Bethel Church in Redding, California. Oh, look at the secret sensitive movement. Oh, look at the government club. Oh, look at the, the promise keepers. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. Always something new. Always something new. Solomon said, Amen. There's nothing new on this. No, it's Jesus. See, that's what I'm trying to say. That's what we're supposed to be preaching. We're supposed to be preaching Jesus. And not just his name, and not just his miracle, and not just that he was a good man, or not that he was just a prophet. The Muslims say he was a good prophet. No, he had finished work. No, Jesus did. He died on the cross. And, 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 and he did. And he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. And, and he is the lamb that was slain. And look, he had seven horns. Now, spiritually speaking, the, again, the word seven describes fulfillment. And you know what horns are described in the Bible? Power. Authority. The horns of the altar. Okay. He's, he's got the fulfillment of all power. It, it actually says it in the book of Colossians that God has placed all power under his feet. Amen? And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, we've already talked about that. They're not seven Holy Spirits. Okay? But it's the fulfillment of the Spirit of God. There are seven attributes of the Spirit of God. We talked about that out of the book of Isaiah. It's actually in Isaiah 11. But we're not going to turn there. But look, I want you to see that seven eyes. Again, the fulfillment of seeing, you know? God is om omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. God is omniscient. That means he knows everything. God is all he sees everything. Amen? You know what's so beautiful, though? Now, I gotta admit something. I'm gonna have to admit something, too. Because I gotta admit. Now, some of y'all might throw it back in my face one day, and that's fine. But I will tell you this. That because these seven eyes the seven eyes of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus has perfect clarity, and you and I serve him, and we die and we're in him, you and I can see better. Amen? Amen. I'm not trying to tell you that we got perfect clarity, because actually Paul said it's like seeing through a glass dimly, but what I'm here to tell you, we see a whole lot better when we submit to the Lord. The Holy Spirit is going to give us some wisdom. Now, I admit to you, I thought that my discernment skills were really good a while back, and I went, I told you I went to a home with and I drove up in the driveway and I saw this scripture. I'm in the I drove up in the driveway and I saw this scripture. But when I walked in, the demeanor of the person reminded me of the Lord. With like not really fully. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And then I'm walking out and I saw a notebook and it said the name. Well, the Holy Spirit was real funny about that. So I'm like, yeah. So I came to church and I said, oh yeah. Lord, show me about what I was next for. I went over there the other day, and that brother, <laughs> he's, a, he's not, he's a pastor. So, sometimes, we think we know, I'm willing to admit it to you, don't be throwing back my thing, bro. I just knew, bro, like, the Holy Spirit is giving me some discernment, well, guess what, I discerned wrong. <laughs> but I will tell you this, you still have access, I have access to these seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of the Lord, that he will give us wisdom and clarity as we yield to his, to his Holy Spirit. Amen. So, verse 7. He came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So, so the lamb, the lion that was slain, took the scroll out of the Father's hand. And when he had taken the book or the scroll, the four beasts and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, 
having every one of them hearts and golden vials. Now, I, I want you to imagine this. So when we get to chapter, I want to say 11, I think it's 11, we're going to see this similar type scene again. What the 24 elders, and it's also the 144,000 are going to be involved in this, and they're going to be singing a song, and it's a new song, okay? And look, they have hearts, though. I, want, I do want to point something out here. So, so look, the 24 elders, I'm, I've already told you, I don't really know who these guys are. I've heard one preacher say, oh, these are probably 24 pastors. There's no way we can prove that. I kind of like the idea that it could be representative of the 12 tribes and representative of the 12 apostles. I personally believe these are people that are dead and already in heaven. And the reason why is because I believe that this is chronologically before the rapture. Okay? Um, uh, but what I do know is this, is that these four beasts, so these four angels, are angels. And if you know this, Jesus did not die for angels. Okay? He died for man. He died to redeem the seed of Abraham. You can find that in Hebrews chapter 2. It talks about that. Okay, so, but, but what I want you to see is, is that when he took the book, then what happens? The four beasts and the 24 elders, they fall down again before the Lamb. Now, having every one of them hearts and golden vials full of odors, okay, which is the, the word is translated from the idea as an aromatic substance, a burnt incense, okay? So golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So I, so let's just slow down a second because, you know, I'm even thinking about it as I'm talking about it right here. There's this scene in heaven, and there's this anticipation for these seals to be opened. Because the word of God is written, and until these seals are opened, the next, the next stage in God's plan cannot be fulfilled. That's right. and, and so there's this problem because nobody's worthy, but then... Now, we realize that the line of the tribe of Judah is indeed worthy because he's prevailed because he's the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth, right? And then we see that they fall down, the 24 elders and the four beasts, before the lamb. I want you to see that. Because see, whenever you fall down like this, what, what are you doing? You're worshiping. You're worshiping. Because you don't fall down and you don't give glory. And I want you to understand something that this tells us. And this describes that Jesus is God. Amen. Because he is receiving worship from both angels and whoever these 24 elders are. And they have hearts. And they have these golden vials which are the prayers of the saints. Now can you imagine all of the saints that have gone before us? I got to admit to you that when I first got saved over there at Twin City Gospel, people in the church used to pray a whole lot more than what we do now. Yeah. Right? Help me out. I mean, look. Yeah. Me and Gally just had probably one of the little best, I hate to admit it, one of the best prayer services before everybody got to church. Uh, and, you know, when the whole, we need, to, we need to be a praying people. Yes, Amen? Amen? Yes, we do. And listen, back back whenever I first got saved, people prayed. Amen? And they, they, they tried. And so look, can you imagine, though, no, let's not beat up on the modern church too bad. Let's just say, can you imagine all the saints from the time of Jesus and how many prayers have gone forth? For God's kingdom to come. And it's all loaded up right here. This incense is just going up in the midst of these 24 elders and these four angels have fallen down. And they sing a new song. Look at this. They sing a new song. And this is what the, song, the lyrics say. You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals there. You see, somebody had to be worthy. Because this is going to this is gonna open the door to a lot of pain. And a lot of heartache. And a lot of suffering. See, not just anybody can open up and see. Somebody that had to be worthy. And you know, he's the root and he's the branch. He's the lion, but he's the lamb. And you see, you really can't call Jesus into question. It might be all, they, don't be, they can call me into question. They can call, me, they can call Jesus into question. That's true. Well, what are you trying to say? He laid down his life. He left his home, which was heaven. He humbled himself. That's what it says. He humbled himself. So that in the book of Philippians, it says, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not consider it something to be held on to, but he humbled himself and he became a man so that he could be a servant through death, even the death of the cross. 
Okay, that's the same mind. What was it? It was a mind of humility. And so the Apostle Paul wants you and I to be reminded to say, let the same mind that was in Jesus also be in you. Amen? A mind of humility. So listen, tomorrow morning when you wake up, this is a little side note. Tomorrow morning when you wake up and you get dressed and your spouse already aggravates you, okay? And then you go to work, okay? And you go to work and somebody at work aggravates you, okay? Guess what? Humble yourself. <laughs> Lord, help us to humble ourselves. <laughs> one thing, one thing that I just want to say this because I just thought about it. One thing that I do believe that the Lord showed me, I don't always do it right, I don't know that. But let me say this. The Lord showed me that there's great power in humility. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, and I know I've told this story before, but whenever I first, when my sister died, and I was so broken and so much in pain, and when I first started waking up early in the morning to worship the Lord, right, I didn't really know how to truly worship the Lord. I really didn't. And I really didn't know how to truly get in touch with God. But in that brokenness, and as I started to put that worship music on and getting alone with the Lord, and His presence started to overwhelm me, it became my more of my norm than some distant Thing. You see what I'm saying? And I became more comfortable in that than where I was before. And I can remember the first time that I was sitting in Cornerstone. And all of a sudden, I felt like the Lord was telling me, I want you to go up to the front and worship me like you do at your house. Okay. And, and whenever I was, there were a lot of thoughts went through my mind. Number one, people are going to think I did some egregious sin, right? Okay. Yeah, we, we know the story of that. all that So, but anyway,
and he can have made us into our God kings and priests. Well, we can just preach forever on that, but I'm going to keep it. Y'all remember, y'all remember whenever I talked about Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews? Y'all remember that name? You can at least remember the name Melchizedek. Melchizedek. <laughs> Melchizedek. It only talks about it two times in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, and also in the book of Hebrews. Melchizedek, this strange figure that showed up out of nowhere. He was in the Old Testament. Abraham paid tithes to him. Okay. Amen. He was a king priest. He was the king of Salem and priest of God Most High. Salem, before it was known as Jerusalem, he was king of peace. He was, he was, he was king of peace, and he was priest of God Most High. He was a king priest. Jesus is now. He's, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He liveth to ever make intercession for us. He was the King of Kings, and now He's the priest. He's made you and I to be King priests, and we shall reign. Listen to me, Christian. You ain't gonna get everything you want on this side of the world. It ain't gonna happen because it wasn't written that way. It's not supposed to be that way. Some of you may become very successful. Some of you might have some big old business, big old bank accounts before we go on the Lord. I don't know. Some of you might drive some nice vehicles before so long. You might. God might bless you. You might have lost some stuff, but guess what? God knows how to give it back. You know how to give it back a hundredfold. But He don't want you to have it if you don't know what to do with it. Right? Give it an amen. 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 But look, you ain't gonna get everything. Because it's not supposed to be that way. Even if you have the full bank account and you, you drive that Cadillac, I looked at the other day on, on Google, ninety-four thousand dollar Cadillac. That thing was bad to the bone. But guess what? Even if you got all that, guess what? That's not. You're not going to get everything on this side because it's not supposed to be that. So quit looking at it. That's good. Amen. But what I wanted to tell you is this: kings and priests. Because, see, there's coming, see, once these seals are open in that seven, last seven year period is over, the battle of Armageddon takes place, guess what? They usher in the millennial reign of Christ. Thousand years that Jesus is going to rule and reign on this earth. I'm here to tell you it's going to happen. All this other stuff from the beginning has happened up to this point. The next stage is going to happen. The parable of the talents tells us that you were faithful in small things. Now you shall be ruler over many things. Enter into your Jesus is going on a long journey, but he's coming back to settle accounts with his servants. Amen? It's happening. And he's made us. You! Me! I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I'm like, maybe I'll be able to be a mayor of a city. I don't know. You might be a governor of a state. I don't know what it's really going to look like, but there's going to be a hierarchy of some sort. And Jesus is going to rule and reign on the earth. And you and I will be kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And he says, and I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them heard I saying, Boy, listen, I'm telling you, that's so powerful. That I'm telling you right now, there's going to be a day when every creature is going to sing the song of the redeemed. Oh. Listen, the sparrow in the tree did not get redeemed by the blood of Jesus, but there's going to be a day when every creature is going to sing. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him. That live forever and ever. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your beautiful word, Lord God, for your beautiful plan. We don't understand it all. Lord, we don't know exactly when that first seal is going to be open. But I pray, Lord, that your will would be done upon this earth. That you would do your will in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, that you'd fill us up with your Holy Spirit. That you would teach us to die and humble ourselves to you today. We know what your word says. That there's going to be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray, oh Lord God, that you would help us to bow our lives now. Lord, we need your help. We can't do it on our own, Lord. Our flesh, Lord God, and our desires in this world, they try to pull us away. But there's a place in our heart, Lord. I know that there's a place in the hearts of the people that are in this sanctuary and the people that watch on video. They wouldn't be here if it wasn't true. They wouldn't watch if it wasn't true. Lord, there's a place in our hearts, Lord God.